I just wanted to very briefly kind of introduce, introduce and set the, the scene um, around today's talk around the state of open infrastructure. And really, we wanted to, um, with, with Caitlin, uh, explore how in the rapidly evolving landscape of scientific research, open science infrastructures are really pivotal to ensuring the access to knowledge and fostering innovation. So earlier this year, the team at Invest in Open released the first state of infrastructure report to shed light on trends, issues, and gaps in the investment, uh, uh, in an investment on the adoption of open infrastructure research. Uh, that research builds on their deep engagement with communities across four continents and, will exp and explores critical needs and areas for collective action to truly achieve the aims of open science. It will also include analysis of over 450 million US dollars in funding mapped for open research infrastructure. So we're really excited to find out more about this. Um, Caitlin is the executive director of Invest in Open Infrastructure and IOI is a nonprofit initiative dedicated to increasing investment in and adoption of open tools and software for research. Her career has been centered around open infrastructure organizations, helping them to think strategically about program design, participatory engagement and sustainability. Um, thank you for the kind introduction, William, and also it's wonderful to join Research Libraries UK for the Digital Shift Forum and for this series. Um, as William had alluded to, the work that we do at IOI, and I'll provide a little bit of background about that, uh, is really about how we can help better drive more informed and strategic investment in and adoption of open infrastructure to help further the aims of more equitable and also uh, participatory engagement in research worldwide. Um, this talk will talk a little bit about some of the recent findings from our State of Open Infrastructure report, uh, the inaugural report that was issued this past May with a separate policy report that was issued uh, in August of this last year, and also talk about some of the things that we are tracking as an organization that is uniquely positioned outside of academia and outside of, say, working with a particular funder to help study and monitor the broader space and share those findings with those stakeholders like yourselves um, in terms of those that are working to drive change within institutional settings, research performing organizations, infrastructure providers themselves, and also aligned funders and interpreting that quite broadly. So, Without further ado, uh, a little bit about IOI. Uh, as we've alluded to, our focus is on where we can help catalyze the investment in, um, in terms of funding and kind investment, contributions, but also the adoption of open digital infrastructure. Uh, and we view this as really critical to helping to align with some of the broader aims of achieving open access and open science and even open data, that that infrastructure needs to be similarly designed. Uh, IOI came out of a coalition of individuals, many of those involved in libraries, research offices, open advocacy organizations, tool providers, those that had been working from anywhere between five to 25 years and trying to drive change in the broader space, who were frustrated in the means in which many were hitting some of the sustainability challenges of feeling they were having to compete with other groups they'd rather be collaborating with or competing for ever decreasing funding and brittle dollars that were keeping them from serving the community missions that they were designed to serve. Um, IOI came about from that coalition as an organization to uniquely see where we might be able to push on a few different levers and maybe take a slightly different approach to addressing some of those problems. Quickly, in terms of what we mean by open infrastructure, uh, we take a bit of a descriptive approach to how we interpret open infrastructure. We know that this term means many different things depending on the context in which you're existing. Uh, at a base level, we think of infrastructure as a services, protocol, standards, softwares that the research and academic ecosystem need um, to perform the functions throughout the research life cycle. And when we think about the open qualifier there, looking at that 
narrower set of services that can empower communities to collectively build um, these systems and infrastructures to deliver new improved collective benefits uh, without restrictions and for building that healthier, more interrelated ecosystem that can be more resilient, built upon, interconnected. Um, there's also additional elements that we are always exploring in terms of how, in terms of the spectrum of infrastructure services, where there may be broader alignment with some of the values and principles put forward in a number of different frameworks and also surface through deep engagement with the researcher and library communities around services that are open source at their core, distribute open access content and data, are free to use, uh, community governed and or non-commercial. As for scene setting, and knowing that this is a digital shift group, um, this is likely going to be areas that you've all been working in for quite some time, but just in terms of some uh, broader high level scene setting. Um, we have seen heightened awareness, especially over the past few years, uh, that access to knowledge and data is really critical to address global health challenges, climate change, economic development, let alone uh, being embedded in the ways in which we are working to help support those that are at institutions and at institutional libraries move more equitable research forward, those agendas forward. Um, but despite that, we see a number of factors that have often worked against those broader aims, whether it's consolidation of tools, the acquisition of many of these organizations, uh, struggle business models, content and pricing that makes these uh, participation in research cost prohibitive. And so when we look at some of, and you can see on the left-hand side, some of the opportunities that exist when we talk about open infrastructure, but also some of the complexities, we want to be able to, you know, we'll talk about some of the findings that go into how we're seeing some of these shifts and, and where there may be opportunities as a group uh, here in this call to explore maybe some different avenues forward. So on one side, we see you know, funding from philanthropy, government, institutions like yourselves empower these services to be mission oriented, but also those services are really vulnerable to changes in leadership and often struggle with the long-term operational funding um, and maintenance of those services. Similarly, community development and governance center researchers' needs, more so in some open infrastructure services than in their commercial counterparts. On the other side, we see that communities are often straddled with the cost of development, implementation, improvement without additional funding to make that possible, um, leading to reliance on unpaid labor and often deprioritized timelines for that work. Open solutions built to be customizable in many cases in terms of that being code that you can see and interact with and able to be built on or adapted as needs grow. That takes some specialization and implementation and usability of these infrastructures can be costly and time consuming, leading to, you know, not only additional technical debt, uh, but other challenges in terms of helping to improve even baseline structures or security patches for some of this infrastructure. Many alternatives exist to help serve specific communities, providing a lot of choice to institutions, uh, but also that can lead to unnecessary competition, scarcity of funding, and organizations that end up struggling um, in terms of helping to um, see where they can offset not only their costs, but continue to build sustainable businesses to help serve their specific communities. So as I mentioned, IOI, we came about as a nonprofit initiative um, to see where we might be able to explore these areas and serve these communities to advance change or accelerate the pace of that change in slightly different ways. We do this in a couple of different means. Um, we call our research and evidence-based uh, collection what we refer to as our data room, where we not only dig into things such as the State of Open Infrastructure Report, which I'll be talking about today, we build discoverability tools for infrastructures such as InfraFinder, which I'll highlight a little bit more about, as well as other targeted commissioned research and tools and, and data that others can utilize um, to help inform their decision making. We also provide targeted services and support 
to help infrastructures, uh, institutions, consortia, and even funders help put some of this work into practice, providing fractional support from our team, as well as that research and evidence base to support you know, those that are you know, keeping their foot on the gas and providing critical infrastructure needs, but may need to bring in additional growth transition improvements such as around governance, diversification of funding, strategic support, helping to select various infrastructures and more. And then lastly, we see where we can not only work to continue to expand the types of organizations and companies and funders and other groups that are investing in open infrastructure, helping to get this on the radar of some of those additional groups that we view should be contributing to this broader aim, um, but also see where we can run different funding pilots to experiment with various ways of allocating that resourcing that might help accelerate the embeddedness and the success of these infrastructure services. Um, these programs work together to advance our broader uh, mission, and we've had an initial focus on infrastructure that helps further open access to data and research in line with a number of recent policies from UNESCO's Open Science Declaration, Nelson Memo, G7 Communique, and EU Council guidance, and are always looking at where we might be able to expand that in a thoughtful way. I wanted to talk a bit more today uh, for this audience on some of the recent findings from our State of Open Infrastructure report. Um, we wanted this to be a annual instrument. And this past year in May, we released our first of that. There's an online version that you can access and I'll drop the link in the chat in a moment um, as well, as well as a print copy to help surface the trends, patterns, issues, and gaps in investment and adoption of infrastructure and some of the various uh, elements, wh whether it's around the patterns in funding, um, the various topics such as procurement in that intersection, governance in that intersection with infrastructure adoption, um, as well as some of the areas that we are monitoring as an organization where we're seeing either some opportunities, some areas of change, um, some either divestment in infrastructure. There's a lot that we're continuously at IOI, not only researching and seeing surface in our analysis and our, our desk research, but also from the engagement that we're doing in the operationalizing of our work. And so we wanted to have a place where we could help raise that profile of the infrastructures and identify courses of action and package that together to be able to help move that conversation forward. And I'll be talking through a couple of those different areas here today. Our inaugural report uh, includes an analysis on various characteristics of open infrastructures, as mentioned, an analysis on some of the grant funding um, to give us a better sense as to where funding may be flowing, how it may be allocated, and where there be opportunities um, for more effective allocation of resources. Uh, and thank you for dropping the link in the chat as well. Trends in performance and adoption, regional policy developments, looking at four different continents uh, that we wanted to make sure we were examining how policies were helping to move that work forward. Um, the influence of procurement and IT governance on the adoption of open infrastructure, as well as some additional signals and areas of exploration that we're tracking and monitoring. The key findings that we saw here that open infrastructures demonstrate a strong and widespread commitment to community engagement and governance, uh, as well as transparent policies and practices. Also, based on our analysis of 415 million US dollars uh, that has been qualified going towards open infrastructures, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that means, what that distinction means. Um, we observe that infrastructures are successful in recruiting some support for research and development, but clearly have some unmet needs for operational support. And also there's little investment in strategy, governance, and business planning, um, which are crucial for ensuring their longer term sustainability. And also a diversity of levers are used to advance uh, open science and the scale at which they operate in Africa, Europe, Latin America, US. Um, those are additional areas we've explored in a report over the course of the summer um, around regional policy developments, building on what we have in this um, initial report. 
and that procurement and IT governance processes can add complexity to the adoption and implementation of open infrastructure. Uh, but we find that leveraging consortia and networks for adoption can help mitigate some of the risks to individual institutions. Okay, let's get into it. Terms of characteristics. As I mentioned, uh, IOI also has built out a tool called InfraFinder, which was launched in April of this year. Um, InfraFinder is designed to help those that are making decisions about either choosing infrastructure for their institution, migrating to different infrastructure, looking for broader information, kind of a one-stop shop for those decision makers. Uh, and we originally reached out to 84 open infrastructures for the initial build out to participate in the first round of data collection for InfraFinder. Um, and 57 were accepted for invitation and, uh, and provided us with information. Um, we're currently working on doubling that amount of infrastructure. So it will be over a hundred infrastructures by the end of this calendar year. Um, an infrastructure was eligible for inclusion if it met a few different um, criteria. And we intentionally kept this a little bit broader than some of the specific frameworks that exist in looking at defining in tighter terms open infrastructure, because we wanted to have this comparison function, knowing that designing this for those that are making decisions about, say, a data repository at their institution, that from our engagement with those communities of um, decision makers and stakeholders, we knew that there were a number of different pieces of information that they needed for their case making. And so the criteria, they needed to meet one of one or more of the following, either meeting the definition of open source software, primarily or exclusively distributing openly licensed or open access content, free to use by everyone um, and anyone free of charge or without restrictions, is community governed and is transparent in its operations and finances. And the uh, last is operated by a nonprofit or non-commercial entity. And so participating infrastructures, uh, we worked to collect as much information as we could and then engage with them directly to help address um, some of the other areas of uh, information collection that we were looking for. And then this information not only helped us understand a bit more about the infrastructures themselves, but allowed us to be able to see across um, these infrastructures, which I'll share a little bit more about our findings. And for the State of Open report for this year, grounded our ability to do some of this analysis by looking at some of the infrastructures that we had uh, more rich information about through this process. And so in terms of types of infrastructures, um, first round of data collection for InfraFinder focused primarily on repository related infrastructures, um, and that's reflected by what we see here. Um, you can see that on the left hand side for solution category, we've got discovery and publishing systems, repository services versus software standards that help connect those, those various groups, data sets. And then for those where a hosted option was relevant, most of the time that option is available. Um, if you look on the right hand side, um, the green area there is where um, no hosting services were available. And we mentioned this because we heard in the course of our conversations that this can be a place where adoption of an open solution can be moved more within reach for an institution due to some of the different constraints. And so we've been continuously looking to see where hosted solutions may help with that increased adoption. We also looked at the start of infrastructures over time. Some of the main examples that we see here, um, Archive 1991, Erudy 1998, um, longest lived open infrastructures in the data set, things really took off in the 2000s, likely fueled by many of the open access developments of the time, like the Berlin, Bethesda, and Budapest open access declaration. Uh, the 10 infrastructures that started between 2000 and 2005 include two major repository platforms, including DSpace and Fedora, as well as open journal systems um, from the Public Knowledge Project. And then seven, uh, several other important repository and publishing platforms launched in the teens, the Fulcrum, Haiku, Janeway, and Venio, and others. In terms of business form and governance, nonprofits dominate 
in terms of business form. I think we had this assumption, but it's nice to see it reflected in the data. And since our criteria for open are fairly inclusive, there are some commercially operated open infrastructures that are included in this round. Um, most have some form of community governance, formal or otherwise. And this has become a matter of particular interest as we've seen some of these infrastructures absorbed into or acquired by entities without any kind of community accountability and the repercussions of that. For technical attributes, open code, APIs, documentation are hallmarks of open infrastructures. Open product roadmaps, slightly less common, but still more than 40 open infrastructures out of the 57 report having or planning one. And moving into another area of the report, again, this is giving sort of the high level and we'll have some time for conversation at the end, but I wanted to share some of the key findings to help jumpstart that conversation. Um, as we looked at funding, which IOI has done since it started, um, we wanted to extend and update that work. There is no single comprehensive source of grant award data, um, especially when it comes to infrastructure. There's also no straightforward search term that you can search across all of this data. So we needed a starting point and a scope. Um, the methods here, we focused on the infrastructures I just mentioned in InfraFinder. So we had something to cross-reference against. Um, we know some things about those infrastructures and can combine that knowledge with what we learn about the funding. Um, we also started with a known set of funders. Um, our first grants data set, those mentioned in InfraFinder, um, we prioritized that work. This data set's also publicly available. And um, we have, if you go to the uh, website, we have dashboards that you can play with this data and the characteristics data live on our site. Um, the data sources, you know, and outside of individual funders that made information available. We also consulted resources such as Open Air's uh, grants data and pulled down everything that we could. Um, search terms, names of open infrastructures, variants, recipients, abstracts, descriptions. Um, we reviewed it for relevance and deduplicated that and then categorized the type of activity being funded on the basis of what we could read in the abstract that was available. Um, we recognize that in, in some of these cases, it is not the full representation. We needed to focus on some sources of truth. And so we did work to make sure that what's represented in these findings is based on the data that was made available by the funders themselves, um, knowing again that there's complexity there. Currency conversion was done if needed, and then we built a dashboard. So total funding, as I noted, is around a little, just a little bit over 415 million US dollars, 416 million. Um, the award count, we had about 514 awards, 23 different funders included, and 36 different infrastructures that were represented based off of the 57 that we were searching to kind of cross-reference across. Um, the data set is subject to the limitations just explained, but these are non-trivial sums. It's the largest cut of funding data for infrastructure that we've been able to um, dig into and that we're aware of um, for this specific uh, analysis. As you can see for direct support, and we'll go into a little bit about direct versus indirect, um, you can see some divisions there of 174 million to 218 million in terms of direct versus indirect, and then also adoption support. And this was sort of our first pass at that, um, but some interesting questions started to arise. So when we talk about direct support, um, you know, we expect people want to know who the biggest recipients and funders are. So uh, you can look at some infrastructures that attract a few large awards. Some attract more numerous and smaller awards. Some manage to do both who are highlighted in yellow. So we've got DataCite, Europe, PubMed Central, Open Science Framework, OSF, Fedora, BioArchive, Dryad. Um, we can also look at the top recipients um, in terms of award count on the right-hand side. So you've got dollars in US on the left, you've got recipients on the right. And you can see where that distribution might be slightly uh, vari um, variable there as well. Mm -hmm. 
So they mentioned when we talk about direct versus indirect, one of the interesting things that came up here is that if we look at indirect, you know, what do we mean by that category? So we found a number of awards that name an open infrastructure, because again, it's these are systems that we rely on, right, for research, but awards that name an infrastructure that came up in our search and our um, deeper, you know, and, and analysis in the title or the description, but the money doesn't actually go to the infrastructure. It goes to the user of the infrastructure. So you can see examples here, such as results will be disseminated in peer reviewed publications and on archive.org, but funding doesn't go to maintain archive. Um, materials will be released under Creative Commons licenses or data will be made available through Dryad or GenBank as appropriate. Um, further dividing indirect into use and um, also adjacent, also considering awards that support adoption. We're not discussing that one today. Um, we have examples here from the use of that, which is interesting in that they um, also show an intended uh, application of those infrastructures, but also, which to me can also be into our team can be signals of how relied upon those infrastructures are, but just an interesting finding as we were digging into this work. And then when we look at um, the top open infrastructures that are named across this large data set, um, it underestimates all intended uses. We expect more mentions in project narratives or data plans. So why is this interesting? Um, point of infrastructure is for it to be used. Use can also lead to support, but it doesn't have to. Um, we've seen this with some of our clients that we've worked with in terms of large infrastructures that balance people conducting significant amounts of research utilizing their platform, but also struggle to have some of the operational support to keep those services maintained and to withstand the increased visits, whether it's those that are building large language models or doing specific types of computational research. Um, is it a potentially useful and interesting signal of the impact of open infrastructure? It could be um, the value of use still add up to more than direct support and the true numbers are probably much higher. Top funders for direct and indirect support um, might be interesting to look at whether support for infrastructure is aligned with the use of it. Um, European Commission and Welcome are still seen as some generous funders of open infrastructure. They support a lot of research that makes use of it and they're highlighted in that kind of teal color. The National Science Foundation in the U.S. is also a big funder from our finding, an even more generous funder of users of open infrastructure. And for further exploration, our team's going to explore, you know, whether or not there's a proportion there that um, tells us anything. We don't want to draw strong quantitative conclusions about this, but these are the kinds of questions that we can continue to explore as we improve and expand our data collection. And the next phase of this is also to double the amount of funders that we have represented. And if anyone has any connections to those that you think we should be featuring or have access to any of that funding data, we'd love to hear from you. Comparing direct support by award category um, with funding needs for InfraFinder, um, we categorized all the direct support grants for these kinds of activities. Um, we also asked InfraFinder participants about their most pressing funding needs and applied the same categories. And that's on the right. Perhaps not a surprise, but research and development tend to get more funding, the building out of new features, while infrastructures say they are in most need of operational support. Okay, I know we're at about half the time, so I'm gonna continue to kind of go through with some of the other high level findings. We also looked at open infrastructure governance. Our goal with this concentrated study was to shed light on a few things that we'd long wondered about regarding infrastructure governance um, for these organizations. So we started with some basic questions that we've studied with individual clients in our strategic services work and um, that we know for um, from other individual open infrastructures that we've founded, hosted, or served in governance roles with across our team. Um, we knew that what we've learned and seen in depth in individual environments needed to be contextualized by a closer look uh, at a spectrum of approaches to governance that were happening within our field. And we wanted to know what types of models are deployed, what nomenclature is used to describe governance groups, and to better understand the diversity or lack thereof in open infrastructure governance groups. What individuals or institutions are participating in various 
governance roles across core infrastructures, how much of an overlap is there? Are we looking at any concentrations in power? And to see if we could start to understand that by doing a little bit of analysis based on infrastructures we had a closer relationship with. So based on InfraFinder, we looked at um, 80, well, we considered not only for the 57 that are in InfraFinder today, but we considered all 80 that we invited um, as part of this study. And the analysis focuses in depth on where there's public documentation um, on the governance models and on the governance uh, members as well. Primarily covers US and Europe for now. Um, and this research was conducted um, at the beginning of this calendar year. We also wanted to look at, you know, the different means in which we could dig into some of the institutional affiliations, the different types of information, uh, and the data set for this is also publicly available. Um, we're looking at means in which we can start to look back beyond just, say, a one-year look back to, say, maybe a five to ten-year look back and continue to build off of that as well. We also use the Wayback Machine both to record current snapshots and included names and affiliations of governance representatives where we could. So how many of these open infrastructures have community governance? So org structures included university hosted, incorporated, fiscally hosted, multi-institutional, informal, different sectors are represented as well. Each of these designations carries its own set of rules and conditions um, in terms of what that may or may not allow for particular governance frameworks. For example, some of the infrastructures are hosted by colleges and universities. These often ultimately answer to or are controlled by their home institutions, board of governors or trustees. Legally speaking, um, community groups that are not governing but are advisory bodies that take on governing functions. Most of the infrastructures have community governance bodies that are named and documented. So if you look at figure one, more than half have, op have this at an open infrastructure level. So for example, DSpace has a governance structure specific to DSpace. Another 12% have govern community governance at either a service group level or a host level. So Archipelago Commons is governed by its host institution, Metro. Um, almost a third do not have any evidence of any community governance. And legal and fiscal ownership is challenging to assume. Open infrastructures that are hosted, less likely in this sample to have infrastructure specific community governance bodies. Um, all 19 that are freestanding or independent programs in our samples have their own. 23 of the 35 hosted infrastructures had evidence of infrastructure specific governance bodies. And so just a lot of complexity and variability here, but just some very interesting things to note in terms of where often some conversations about governance and streamlining specific models can maybe get lost in translation just due to some of the different formations, cultural contexts, institutional contexts, and um, understandings as we look at across this in different regions of the world as well. So challenges, terminology may not match a role. Sometimes names signal an active role in decision-making processes that isn't substantiated. Other times, names signal less control and power than actually is exercised. We can only see what infrastructures also make visible. So sometimes the bodies may exist, but may not be documented openly. And the nomenclature is not standard. So as evidenced by the 26 different overlapping terms used for governance bodies that are represented on this screen. And to our question that we had originally of is this, is are we seeing the same people suggesting a kind of board interlock environment represented across some of the core infrastructures? Like, is there a concentration of power of the same individuals that we may see kind of popping up in many of these conversations? Or is it completely different people? Is there, you know, without the human connective tissues linking the infrastructures, you know, is there, are there benefits or is that to our detriment? Um, in a one-year frame, maybe we hit ju a just right scenario. We had 496 individuals represented serving in 567 total seats. So 48 individuals or 10% hold more than one seat in one of the infrastructure's governance that were represented in our sample. 30 served on two, 14 on three, three on four, et cetera. Institutional distribu distribution, 383 dis institutions were represented. 91 
hold more than one role, so that's 24%, 292 hold only one. So interlock does not seem to be as much of a problem in a single year across this set of infrastructures, but we wanna to expand to a five-year view um, for this next coming year. We also dug into a little bit of procurement and IT governance in the process of how that affects the adoption of infrastructure. From anecdotal evidence, direct experience and work such as that done by the International Coalition of Library Consortia, we wondered whether these processes might support or hinder the adoption of open infrastructures. So we conducted interviews with 12 organizations and we reviewed as much documentation as we could. Business and procurement documents, IT governance documents, policies, procedures, checklists, you name it. Some quick definitions. If we look at IT governance, we're looking at processes that it showed considerable variation. It can be formal or quite informal, um, but it's an organizational process that helps align these decisions with missions and needs, fosters communication across organization, ensures buy-in for policy, budget, project prioritization decisions, et cetera, and also looking at risk management. Procurement generally more formalized and potentially more stringent, um, looking at the selection and acquisition of goods and services in order to maximize cost effectiveness and efficiency and ensure alignment with the institutional priorities. Top concerns by a wide margin, uh, information security and compliance with applicable laws. Um, SLA-like concerns, uh, responsibility of the parties, incident management, response, availability of technical and end user support services. Um, also somewhat common, the technical specifications, intellectual property, like retention of rights for content or code, web accessibility, support for integration with other systems and applications, fit with overall IT strategy, which may or may not include a preference for open, and other attributes that we log that align with the characteristics of open infrastructures that I talked about at the beginning of this presentation, um, governance, community accountability, not very common. Um, in separate conversations with the same senior decision makers in libraries, we heard that these can be important attributes to consider, but they didn't really appear here. Um, value in terms of cost, yes, but for open source software, it also depends on the total cost of ownership. Um, overall documentation reviewed suggest attention to some of these attributes that are more often supported by open source, um, but that openness itself is not an important criteria for selection. Institutions also prioritize finding the best solution to meet a need. You know, again, no big surprise or revelation there. Uh, and a critical early decision point in the process is whether to build or to buy. Um, build, host on premise possibly develop custom solution. But for this talk, we're considering adopting existing solutions by being working with a vendor that provides support for an application, whether that application is proprietary or open source, whether hosted on premise or by the provider. Um, that build versus buy decision has routinely come up in our work is um, key because a buy decision is likely to engage both the IT and governance and procurement space, while build may engage only with IT governance. Um, designed specifically to manage the exchange of money for goods and services, procurement processes can be especially problematic um, for open source adoption where no such transaction takes place unless a vendor supported open source option is under, under consideration. IT governance can also strongly influence the likelihood of open source adoption um, and depends heavily on that organization's culture. And then a key consideration for build is understanding that total cost of ownership or what resources are needed. So if you think that working with a vendor is an automatic pass, the process does require someone who can identify and artic articulate those technical requirements um, and negotiate contracts. So these two processes may not equally serve open source, but um, they uh, open source and proprietary solutions, but um, interesting to just continually know. Quickly, just going through here, uh, we heard in multiple interviews a growing preference for vended solutions um, and also looking at where there might be community vetted service provider programs to offer some um, assurances and help make procurement processes smoother for solutions via working with a service provider. There's also the cost and efficiency and reliability component, knowing that many of the core teams for some of these infrastructure solutions may be uh, quite small. And so having someone that can be more responsive to those needs can be useful as well. 
And then thinking of some of the more recent uh, interesting success stories, we've seen Pelsey and Pelney, two consortia in the United States, lead a multi-tenant repository effort based on Haiku for consortia to serve more than 50 members. The Canadian Association of Research Libraries and Scholars Portal, uh, the Ontario Council of University Libraries, and at the University of Toronto have partnered on National Institutional Repository Infrastructure for Canada, Scalaris, using DSpace. Um, the advantages, power in numbers, safety in numbers, and also economies of scale at every stage, potentially. So in terms of strategies to help support the adoption, uh, educate and encourage an organization's senior leadership to embrace infrastructure, both on the merits and as a strategic priority emerged as the single most important way to facilitate adoption. Um, additional strategies for institutions and adopters, infrastructures, et cetera, is also looking at looking at the institutional policies, you know, preparing and sharing the kinds of documentation that can help support this work if you're an uh, infrastructure community. Um, also for builders, sharing case studies to illuminate total cost of ownership and looking at shared models across consortia and other professional communities. Lastly, wanted to look at some of the future signals, and this is a part of the report. Um, some other elements that we're tracking, which I won't go into too much detail about, um, are the impact of national and regional policies. Um, so, you know, we looked at in our special policy report, which built out from an initial summary in the State of Open Report, some of the different elements across uh, North America, Europe, Africa, and Latin America, um, and also just tracking where there are additional policies, even in the European context, that are starting to affect um, or could potentially affect, such as the European Data Governance Act, um, other, you know, which entered into force in 2022, Cyber Resilience Act, um, other elements that may affect open infrastructures, as well as some of the other bigger platforms. Um, and it's a little bit uncertain as to whether or not the non-commercial aspect of research data and those systems fall into some of this work, um, but it does start to move those conversations forward in a different, different way. Um, we're also looking at, in terms of national and regional policies, some of the digital sovereignty components of where we're seeing stronger uh, efforts to keep information within the bounds of those um, actual country borders and how groups are starting to recognize means of either moving beyond that or working within those confines. Shifts towards diamond models and also preprint models, publish, review, curate, other different types of publishing models. There's a number of different efforts that we've seen to try to rebuild different scholarly publishing models to be more equitable, looking at an assessment of cost structures, different power dynamics coming into play, artificial intelligence and its impact on research outputs and also research licensing. Um, and some of the things that we are seeing about how we're looking at the both the opportunities but also the risks in that space. Funding shifts, near-term implications. You know, we've seen this across the institutional sector. We've also seen uh, the national budgets in various other countries, even looking at um, the Netherlands cutting its budget in half. Um, Horizon um, program had a cut of, I believe, um, up to 2.1 billion euros, uh, the budget to be cut, uh, while the defense and research budget gets a $1.5 billion boost. And also just looking at where those ramifications are for international co collaboration and cooperation. But we're also seeing bolder moves towards open solutions at national and regional levels, moves away from proprietary platforms towards more open platforms um, at the Open Research Europe level, and across other efforts, either led by funders um, or intergovernmental agencies. And so as we look at those, we see a lot of opportunity to see, take and seize a moment on some of the renewed focus on open and shared solutions, whether it's around cost, whether it's around some of the places where there may be different efficiencies, opportunities for shared infrastructure provisioning to again, reduce some of the risk of it carried forward on one institution or another, and cost sharing, and also some of the shifting power dynamics that whether it's based on specific policies or also market um, market elements that may help safeguard and support more institutional investment in open. 
Lastly, we're continuously building out this work. We exist to serve as a resource for you all. Um, we'd love your feedback. And also if there are areas that you'd like us to additionally explore with or for you, um, it would be our honor. My thanks again, and would love to hear your questions. Thanks very much, Caitlin. That was that was great. And there's really there's so much there to unpack. And uh, I think it's it's just been it's just been great to see. So uh, we put in our, we dropped into into the chat, first of all, to kind of encourage people to have a think about if there were any surprises or anything they want to reflect on. Uh, and we have had a, a couple of questions and I'm going to bundle I'm going to bundle a couple of them together uh, and they they mostly focus on um, kind of gaps that are in the you know, you know, gaps that are in kind of in for Finder. Um, and so someone had commented about kind of the most popular UK open repository ePrints um, isn't there. Did that. So the, I guess the question there was, did it, not, did it not meet any requirements or did you just. No, it's it's a great it's a great question, Andy. Um, we have a broader list of infrastructures that we're continuously adding to, that are, um, you know, much larger than what's represented in InfraFinder. So the process there of reaching out to a subset of infrastructures, and then needing also their engagement with the process. In some cases, the infrastructures didn't respond in time. Um, in other cases, we kind of put them on a list for a second cohort. So as I mentioned that we are building out from that 57 an additional 50 to 60 additional infrastructures, ePrints is in that second cohort for that. Um, in some cases, it was as simple as they, you know, they missed the email that we had sent when we were building this out in the beginning. Um, ePrints, we also agree, is very important to the broader ecosystem and is included in our desire to build that out. Um, I'll also note that we've taken a concerted effort to build that out so that we can also be responsible stewards of that information. And so as we move into not only revisiting some of the additional infrastructures we'd reached out to in that first round that may not have, um, you know, may not have been included for various reasons, uh, and some of it is just, you know, getting data back to us in time, We've also been looking at where we have a standing expression of interest form on our site. So infrastructures can always submit to be reviewed at any time. Um, but in addition to that, we're kind of trying to take a more focused approach and looking at additional data infrastructures or preservation and archival infrastructures. Because the last thing that we want is as this scales to say have like one library information system uh, solution that may inadvertently appear as if we are recommending that among all like above all others and not have comparison and so just from our team's capacity side we want to make sure we're being thoughtful about building that out um, but I will follow up with the the team because I believe ePrints is in our next cohort um, and I know it's been a topic of conversation so thank you for flagging it. Thanks very much for that. And I think sort of related to that, and that's great that there's a standing forum. So I think we've got some, so, you know, so a really kind of great and engaged audience uh, day as well. So there's a couple of other infrastructure projects like Rec, Repec and kind of Biomed News. Um, so and colleagues are asking about that. So what is, is the best thing for them to follow up with IOI or what, what, what would, what would their next steps be to, Absolutely. Yes, inject, them into the, in, inject them into that process. I will pull up the link for you. You can always reach out to me um, individually, but I will also, on the InfraFinder site at the top, there's, I'll drop the link in right now, one sec. Sorry to be looking off to the side of my screen. Um, but here is, and you can always, and this is actively monitored by our team, but here is the link if you'd like to add an infrastructure and the expression of interest. And we review those every week. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, and it's great to see some of that activity in the chat. If people want to also fire those into the Q&A, that, that would help us. We've still got, well, we've only got a, a few minutes left, but that's really great to see that. So thank you for that. And we'll, uh, we can also help to reflect that, that out. Um, there's an interesting comment in the, or, or it's a question in the Q&A, but uh, asking about shared board governance. Mm -hmm. And so thinking about your, your sure. comment about interlocking. Uh, the question was about, is shared board governance a way to help coordinate strategically 
across diff diverse infrastructures. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess the sidebar there was it was framed in the report almost as kind of negatively as an interlock, but mm -hmm. you could in positive elements. So I don't know if you had some some thoughts around. The yeah, I mean, it's hard. It's hard to characterize it um, with just a broad brushstroke because again there is so much nuance i mean there are shared board shared you know governance models that exist over constellations of projects that i think provide a lot of resilience there's also within one governance model there may be different terms that are at play for how you know different groups are included in that governance like are we talking about the same leaders of organizations that serve indefinite terms versus groups that are looking at a different representation of those community viewpoints and may have a healthier, more robust established mechanism for rotating so that you don't see the same people making decisions over, say, six to 10 years of a duration um, and looking at how they're also managing and operationalizing their governance. And so I think that there are some really fascinating elements there. I think the the same assumptions that we had in wanting to interrogate the grant funding information, like are the major funders all supporting the same 15 projects? Are those the 15 projects that should be supported? Are they the ones that are helping to meet the needs of the research communities? Um, or is it just because those are the most well-known, right? And, and challenging some of those assumptions, those part of why we wanted to look into the governance side to say, you know, is it the same four organizations that are uh, leading some of the decisions for these bigger groups? And are there different elements that may be missed in terms of, say, global representation or representation of different um, areas of growth that just from, you know, those person, those individuals standpoints that may be limited. Um, and so we know that this is just an initial place to look for some of those signals to then dig into in a more um, in-depth way. Uh, and I think we were pleasantly surprised to see that it was much more representative than we had, I think, presumed going into that, especially just by the nature of humans. You start to see the same people come up in various or you know conversations. And so we wanted a data driven way to say, like, is that really what we're feeling? Are we seeing the same people come through or is that just a natural part of human condition um, in the way in which we socially organize? Yeah, I, I think your comment as well, you know, this being the, the kind of inaugural report and, you know, almost kind of really interesting kind of baselining that. So as you were saying as well, being able to sort of pull out to look at what that would look like over five years, you know, yeah. I think as well will be, you know, kind of start to be interesting to see kind of the individuals and, and, and so on. Um, that's really good. Uh, right. No one else has put any questions in. However, there's been some active chat, uh, which I'm going to sort of definitely turned into to questions in the, last, in the last kind of couple of minutes as we come to an end. Um, so there was one about, uh, a, well, these are more comments about kind of infrastructure that's perhaps not as transparent. Um, mm -hmm. Does this mean there isn't a formal agreement over the importance of transparency? Uh, I, I it's a, know, yeah, it, uh, it's a great question. So in some cases, I mean, uh, that I will reserve the right to the fact that some people don't believe that sharing information about their governance or their minutes or what have you, they, they view that as potentially damaging, right? To like whether or not they have specific efforts or they view that as a means of competitive information, like ac competitors accessing information about their strategies. We have seen use cases where in bigger, like in not even bigger, but in some open organizations where that's at, at play. It, more so, I would say, anecdotally, uh, it's because the work that's invested in having all of this information be transparent may exceed the staffing capacity that an organization may have. And so thinking of that, you know, in a much more positive way of, we often say that, you know, for infrastructures at their core, you can't really afford to take your foot off the gas, which is why, like, with our strategic support services for IOI, why we you know, set that up was that we were finding that many of these infrastructures uh, and particularly focusing initially on those infrastructures like archive, bioarchive, medarchive, 2I2C, et cetera, um, that they wanted to expand into other areas or they needed to make certain improvements to get on stabler footing, technically, organizationally, funding wise, et cetera. Uh, but 
the capacity to actually start implementing some of those changes was a real hindering factor. It wasn't just about the money to be able to fund that future bid. Um, and so, you know, I, I, we see that time and time again, everyone is resource trapped or, you know, always operating at a bit of a deficit. And so I think there's areas there also in terms of peer learning, many of the infrastructures have reached out saying, you know, I didn't realize that I needed an open data policy. Do you have an example? This provides us an opportunity to be able to say, actually, we've got five um, or we have 12, right? Or maybe this one's better suited for your purposes and able to be built on so that you can start to again, um, grow and move along that sort of spectrum of openness in positive ways.